Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. We're excited that you've joined us today for NASCA TV. We're going to talk about innovative state initiatives to encourage diversity and inclusion in procurement. We have a lot of folks dialing in today, so we're going to give everyone just a moment or two to get connected to the audio, have a chance to log into our Zoom platform here and get excited about the conversation that we're gonna have with our speakers today. We have four excellent panelists with us today to share what's happening in each of their states. And we'll have an opportunity to talk a little bit about some of their processes, their strategies, and how they're working to ensure diversity and inclusion around the procurement process system. So again, as you're just coming in to join us, I will ask that you rename yourself um, we'd love to see who's here, what state you're from. So if you'll put your name in your state or your company, that really helps us to see our audience know who's here, get a chance to get to know you. If you will, just um, maybe drop a hello in the chat, uh, drop your LinkedIn profile if you'd like to connect with NASCA. We would love again to um, connect with you socially. We've got Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, would love to have you connect with NASCA and see all of the exciting upcoming activities with our NASCA TV events. So again, I see a lot of folks coming in. Thank you all for dropping your information in chat. We've got an exciting lineup today again to talk around procurement and what it means um, when we're talking about enhancing diversity and inclusion. Really, what does that look like in the States? So again, we've got four fantastic speakers today who are gonna share and bring you their exp experience and thought leadership around some of the processes that they're implementing in their individual States. So let's go ahead and kick off today. But before we introduce our speakers, um, let's bring up a, a couple of poll questions. We'd love to kick off our NASCA TV events with some polls. Hi everyone. I'm not sure what happened with Pam. Um, it looks like she's having technical difficulties. So um, I'm going to jump in here real quick. Um, it looks like she's coming back on, I hope. Um, I'm going to give it another technical minute and then I will start the poll questions. Um, if everybody Thank you again for um, putting your information in chat. Um, this is one of our best webinars to kick off the new year. So I'm just gonna go ahead and go ahead with the poll questions. Thanks, Thanks Tammy. Tammy. Okay. <laughs> uh, we are having a few technical difficulties. <laughs> and there's a lot of reverb on yours. so. I'm gonna go ahead and launch the questions and go ahead and read them. Poll question number one, does your state or company have a dedicated program that provides targeted outreach to minority owned businesses for government contracting opportunities? Please pick one. Everybody seems to, um, I'm gonna give us some feedback on that. Um, the choices are yes, we have a fully functional process to yes, but we are still growing the program or no, not at this time. So I'll give everybody a couple more minutes to, well, minutes, seconds to go ahead and, and get everybody answered in there and then we'll share the results with the group. All right. All right. The results seem to be not overwhelmingly, yes, we have a fully functioning process, but 54% of who answered um, then in second place, uh, still growing your program and no, not at all. So um, it, everybody, the majority are doing their programs. So I'm gonna go to poll question number two. Let's go to question number two. I'll launch that. Does your state or company have set aside programs where a certain percentage of government contracting is de designated for minority firms? Um, please pick one. Um, yes, our goal is 10 or 10% or less. 
goal is 11 to 25, goal is greater than 25, goal depends on the availability of the firms or no, we do not have a set aside goal at this time. Like I said, I'll give it a couple of uh, seconds for everybody to kind of get their response in and hopefully Pam will be back on by the time we're ending our poll questions. Thank you, Tammy, for jumping in here. You know, technology is fantastic when it works. That's what they always say, right? <laughs> Um, unfortunately, something um, happened with our studio camera, so I'm just going to go from my laptop here in the office and uh, we'll just carry right on. So thank you so much, Tammy, for running our two poll questions. I greatly appreciate you jumping in and doing that. And thanks to everybody again that's on the call for helping us by answering those. Again, it's just a great foundation as we're getting ready to jump right into our speaker. So let me introduce the four state team members that are here with us today. They're going to share a little bit about the work that they're doing. And again, really all focused on um, women-owned, small business, enterprise-wise programs that are all looking to increase diversity and inclusion in their individual states. First, we have um, Jared Ambrosier, who is the Chief Procurement Officer at the State of Michigan. We have Commissioner Alice Roberts Davis, who is with the Department of Administration at the State of Minnesota. We have Chief Procurement Officer and Deputy Director Angela Shell in the Department of General Services in the State of California. And then we have Director Tara Smith, who is with the Department of Enterprise Services in the state of Washington. So um, we're going to have just a very informal conversation. I've asked each of our panelists if they would start out just by sharing a little bit about what's happening in their state, what their process looks like. And then again, we're going to unpack some of these as we get on through today's webinar. So Tara, can I turn to you first and ask if you'll share a little bit about what's happening in Washington and about some of the programs you have underway? Thank you, Pam. I'm excited to share that with everyone. And I'm not surprised to, to see the level of interest around this topic. I have seen and, and heard from my colleagues across the country um, in the centralized public procurement function that this is something uh, we've all been struggling with. And I'm really pleased to be a part of uh, this conversation and appreciate NASCA for bringing us all together on this topic. So in thinking about where to start with this conversation, because like many states, Washington has been struggling with equity and contracting for a long time. And, um, and thinking through what programs I would highlight or innovations, I, I decided to start with what I think is a really relevant starting point, um, even though our, our, our work began before this. Um, because states would benefit from hearing about this bigger picture aspect of uh, inclusion and equity in contracting. Um, so I start with the 2019 disparity study that the state of Washington conducted. Um, certainly for years before that, we had established many, many programs to help support minorities and women-owned businesses. Um, but the disparity study in 2019 was an important really first step for a long-term program. Um, and in that study, it was made very clear in black and white that minorities and women do not enjoy equal access to contracting opportunities. And that is verbatim from the report. Um, and we're benefiting now from a lot of other recommendations that were made, um, but that was an, an important finding for the longer term uh, program that um, we're establishing. And for those of you who might not be familiar yet with what I mean by a disparity study, uh, the way it's described is as a statistical analysis that presents evidence of where there might be underutilization of minority and women firms compared to their availability uh, in a certain market area. Uh, so that's an important distinction to make uh, and to have available um, as a part of a, a long-term record for a, a program. Um, when that study came out in 2019, uh, I don't think it was a surprise to, to anybody. Like I said, Washington has been working since at least 2015 on a myriad of programs to support this work. Um, and certainly those stakeholders who have been trying to work with the state 
uh, for many years and, and maybe struggling to keep their own businesses open, they knew already that this disparity existed. But that study itself, like I said, was such an important first step in a long-term process because anecdotal evidence alone doesn't, doesn't create or withstand the legal scrutiny that uh, a race or gender-based program needs to be able to withstand. Uh, to be legal de legally defensible, a race and gender-based contracting program for public sector contracts has to meet a very uh, strict scrutiny judicial test. Um, so I won't go into that now and I'd be happy to talk to anyone about, about what that means. Um, but the disparity report in 2019 was a very important first step to us. So where are we now? Um, we, my agency, the Department of Enterprise Services, um, is one of multiple agencies across the state who are working together to support uh, what we've termed the Washington Roadmap for Contracting Equity. Um, and like I said, this is one step in a longer term process uh, to create what we want to see as really durable, sustainable change. Um, so we've created this legal path forward that centers right now around data collection. Uh, that's something uh, I'll probably talk about later as an important part of, a, of an overall program. Data collection that shows who's getting what contracts across the state. Um, we have established and as part of our roadmap to contracting equity, robust ra race and neutral race and gender neutral programs. And I say that and emphasize race and gender neutral because from a legal perspective, that is an important part of the legal path. We have to be able to identify whether neutral programs have had a success or not down the road. Um, we also obtained, and I think it was really smart of the state a few years ago to obtain a legal opinion from our attorney general that outlines for agencies what race-based programs we may be able to implement or conduct or not right now. So we do what we can within legal parameters to, to provide race and gender-based programs, but that legal opinion helps keep, keep us on the right uh, roadmap to full equity. Um, and then at a certain point in time, when we have this data that we've collected, um, when we've established a robust uh, race and gender neutral program, we'll be able to evaluate those contracts and maybe do uh, another disparity analysis to determine whether they've had a significant impact. And if not, uh, that will be our legal uh, path to create a gender and race-based neutral program. So, um, we're working, like I said, very closely with our partner agencies across the state. Uh, our governor, Jay Inslee, recently issued uh, already here in 2022 two uh, new executive orders that center around this topic. The first executive order was all about equity and contracting. Um, and the second one, also in the month of January, that was just issued is around equity and government in general and, and brings in other elements beyond contracting. So I'm really proud to be a part of an administration that uh, has certainly prioritized this work. There's a lot of momentum around this work in the state of Washington right now, and it's really exciting for me to be a part of something that uh, will have such an important and meaningful impact on our community. Thanks, Tara. I really appreciate that. And I am so appreciative of the fact that you founded uh, or set the foundation through the study that you all did a few years ago and how important that has been to the state. If any of our members on the call today would like to take a look at the governor's executive orders, or is there a certain place that they could take a look at those? Certainly. Um, I was just looking my, at them myself to make sure that I got the numbers right. Um, if you go to Governor Jay Inslee's website, um, that, was the mo that was the easiest way for me to find them um, and look at his executive orders. They were just issued, so they'll be the, at the top of the list. Equity and contracting is uh, Executive Order 2201, and Equity and Government is Executive Order 2202. Fantastic. I know our 
attendees will be glad to take a look at those. So thank you so much. Um, and please go ahead and continue to drop your questions in the chat. We will have some time to circle back with our panelists on those. So thank you. I um, mean, again, Tara, thank you so much for sharing what's happening in the state of Washington. Alice, let's turn over to you and see what's new in Minnesota. What have you all have going on in this area? Well, thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to be here today. I'm always very energized by this topic, so I will try and say uh, as much as I can in the time that I'm allotted. Uh, we are so proud of our Office of State Procurement, which is here at the Department of Administration and is home to our Office of Equity and Procurement. And in addition, we are one of few states that also host the state's Procurement Technical Assistance Center, or the PTAC, um, which reports directly to me. We have had a program for targeted group economically disadvantaged and veteran owned businesses here in the state for more than 40 years. But I joined the state in 2015 in part to help reimagine our program here. And in 2015, we had less than one FTE, no systems for reporting. And today we are in the process of uh, onboarding our 15th team member responsible for diversity and inclusion in state contracting and government contracting overall. Um, in the time, our growth of spend with targeted group economically disadvantaged and veteran owned businesses has grown from less than 4% in 2015 to trending to 9% for fiscal year 2022. That's more than double in six years. And we've set a really aggressive goal of 12% of state spend with uh, TGEDVO businesses, which we may not reach in 2022, but there are a number of things that we've put in place to move in that direction. We know which levers to pull now, as you can see, we're making really positive progress and momentum in that direction. Um, so the idea now is to double down on some of those really uh, great things that we know are working. The first thing that we did back in 2015 was we developed training that was mandatory for any of our procurement professionals across the state. So more than 700 people were trained in that first year. Anyone who was doing procurement had to sit down and go through a practical training that was uh, interactive and it gave them the feeling of a small business owner and how it would feel competing against a an incumbent, much larger, much more uh, asseted business and uh, gave them that feeling of how it would feel to not be able to be as competitive and, and, and helped us show them some empathy um, and uh, gave them the tools to work better with small business owners. And so um, that was the first thing that we did was require that training for all of our procurement professionals. The second thing that we did was we sat down with business owners and listened to them and uh, heard their concerns about what makes it difficult to do business with the state and took away a lot of those concerns and tried to find applicable and actionable things that we could do. Uh, one of the things that came out of that was uh, a, new pro a new process called prompter pay. Uh, we know it's not the best English in the world, but it, it gets the point across. We pay all of our vendors within 30 days, but for targeted group economically disadvantaged and veteran owned businesses, we pay them more promptly. We pay them within 15 days. That's hardwired within our system. And that is a direct response to the feedback that we received that they need more direct access to capital than their larger competitors. And so uh, prompter pay has been a really huge success for our small business uh, owners. The next one that I'm really, really proud of is a program that's called Equity Select. And of course, in government contracting, everything is done by competitive bid, unless in Minnesota, you are a targeted group business, in which case we can directly select you up to $25,000 without any competition. This has been really tremendous for us because it appeals to our buyers because they don't have to go through the long process of competition. And it's great for our targeted group businesses because they use it as a marketing tool. They talk to our buyers and say, hey, I'm equity select eligible. You can use me today. And uh, it's kind of a, a match made in heaven, if you will. One of the things that we'd really like to do is expand this program and make it larger. And I'll talk about that just in just a moment. We've been very focused on outreach and in FY21 alone, we had 121 outreach events with more than 8,000 participants. Our marquee events last year were summits that we held and we aligned those with celebration months. So for example, in Black History Month, we invited all of our black owned businesses to hear about um, what it means to be a black owned business in Minnesota. We had one uh, in Women's History Month 
for our woman-owned businesses. And I, along with Steve Grove, who is a commissioner of employment and economic development, uh, kicked off those events and talked about the economic landscape in the state and the global economic landscape and what it meant to those types of businesses. We did eight of those summits last year for each type of business that we do that's um, disadvantaged business here in the state. And they were uh, very, very well received. So we're very proud of the outcomes for those. We have a program called Sheltered Markets. And what we do is as long as we have at least three businesses that are um, target, targeted group, economically disadvantaged or veteran owned, we will wall off those competitions so that only targeted group businesses compete, which means that we can uh, ensure that that competition will go to a disadvantaged business. And so uh, essentially we can directly funnel money into a targeted group business uh, for a particular um, procurement that's happening. And then one of the things that I'm most proud of is a new dashboard that we've created within the state. These are produced for our agency partners and we produce these on a regular cadence and um, they're pr produced by data scientists in our results team. Each one of these fields is a particular area of um, spend within each agency and they can click on it and get the data behind it. But what that does is it helps them understand how they're spending their money and where there are better opportunities for them to direct their spending toward targeted group businesses. We then meet with each agency and give them ideas on where they could redirect their spend. Um, I'm going to skip down because I know I'm probably running out of time, but again, I get very energized about this topic. One of the things that we're looking forward to is um, during legislative session, we will be asking for an increase on our equity select program from $25,000 to $100,000, we just think that that will be really um, a huge boon for our targeted group businesses so that we can channel even larger uh, contracts into those small businesses and help them grow. And then we'll also be asking for our bid preference to be increased from 6% to 12%, meaning that if a business is bidding and they're within 12% of a majority owned business, then we could potentially award that um, contract to a minority owned business or a targeted group business of some sort. We are really pleased with the growth and progress of our program, but we recognize that there's still really tremendous work for us to do in order for all of our communities to have the opportunity to participate in equitable uh, government contracting. And so with that, I'll turn it back to you, Pam, thanks. Thanks, Alice, so much. And so much happening there in Minnesota. Um, the Equity Select program is quite impressive. And so I hope you, are successful with the legislature. Also, I'll also say to the group, um, check out the dashboard. Um, it's so interactive, so robust and filled with data. It's a great tool to use um, and you know, maybe use as an idea for your own state as well. So thank you, Alice, I appreciate it. Jared, tell us what's happening in Michigan. Thanks, Pam. Um, so in Michigan, we're really at the beginning of our DEI journey for procurement. Um, Michigan is constitutionally prohibited from using race and gender in um, procurement decisions. Um, and so that sort of puts some very clear guidelines around what we can and cannot do um, in the DEI space. In 2019, uh, Governor Whitmer issued an executive directive 2019-8, which directed us to um, increase contracting opportunities with geographically disadvantaged business enterprises. Um, and so what we did is we kind of took the spirit of that executive directive and we developed a program called the My Supplier Community Program. Um, this program, this policy reduces the bidding um, roadblocks that are in place for certain business types. So for certain communities, certain business communities, we are allowed to directly contract with them without having to go through an RFP process, similar to in Minnesota. Um, some of the kind of intricacies of that would be um, if you're a, a member of this community, um, we are able to obtain three quotes up to $500,000. So normally our bidding threshold is at $50,000. Um, anything above 50 has to go through a competitive um, you know, RFP publicly posted. But if you're within that My Supply Community Program, we're able to um, collect three quotes from three different vendors within that community 
then we can contract directly without having to go through an RFP process. So we're trying to streamline that contracting process, both for the state agencies, so they are incentivized to go to these communities, as well as streamline it for the businesses so that they don't have to go through, um, you know, such a rigorous, um, direct, formulaic process as an RFP. Um, some other things that we've kind of done to increase this this is we hired a geographically disadvantaged business enterprise specialist. So this is our first um, dedicated resource that is only for kind of increasing opportunities throughout the procurement space. We've put policy in place that uh, when companies, if they are going to be subcontracting on a larger bid, then a portion of that subcontracting work needs to go to a GDBE. And if they, they're unable to use a GDBE for subcontracting, they need to tell us why. Um, a lot of these are still in their infancy. So we're, we're seeing both the benefits and the drawbacks of them, and we're evaluating as we go. One thing that I think has shown very clear impact right away, though, is our social media activity. And so beyond just publicly posting on our um, e-procurement site, various RFP opportunities, we are doing a more active push through social media, uh, really trying to get out on Twitter and going using different listservs and trying to push um, different contracting opportunities to groups that potentially have never interacted with the state before. And, but that might, they might catch their eye on Twitter to say, hey, you know, I can provide that service, I can provide that commodity, and then they might engage on the e-procurement side to uh, contract with us further. I'll kind of stop there and talk a little bit more later on. Thanks, Jared. I know you opened up by talking about the constitutional prohibitions in the state of Michigan. Um, can you just explain a little bit more on maybe how this current administration in the state is really focusing on this, how you're expanding into the regional diversity and share a little bit more about that? Yeah, so, you know, while we can't uh, focus on race and gender, there's other communities that still need assistance. And oftentimes, um, women-owned business or minority-owned businesses are part of those communities as well. So by focusing on that geographically disadvantaged, um, which is based on, you know, federal hub zone or qualified opportunity zone, you're reaching some of the same groups, but without, you know, um, using race and gender as that determining factor. Uh, so, you know, you take the city of Detroit, for instance, right, there's a lot of qualified opportunities in there. While the city of Detroit is, you know, predominantly a minority group, I can also go to a rural community within Michigan that is not a minority based that is still geographically disadvantaged. Um, and we're looking to boost both of those communities up um, in the contracting process, not just the minority one in the, the big cities. That's helpful. And Jared, if you don't mind, I am going to call off a question to you that's uh, to Michigan specifically. One of our attendees has asked, how do you ensure that the buyers are not going to the same suppliers for the $50,000 threshold? Yeah, so they have to, um, have to go through. So if they want to utilize the My Supplier Community Program, they have to submit a request to me. Uh, and, and that request, it goes through um, one of my one of my staff members who kind of vets it and makes sure that everything is on the up and up. Because you're right, that is definitely a concern. Uh, we haven't seen that, that type of abuse yet, um, but it is something we are keeping our eye on as the program kind of matures a little bit and is used more um, because that, that could be um, an issue. Great. Very, very helpful. Good to hear. And as you mentioned, Michigan really is a little bit more um, on the novice side, just um, getting underway with a lot of your programs there. So it's nice to hear the differences among the states. So Angela, let's hear a little bit about what's happening in your world there in California. Thanks, Pam. And thank you all for uh, having us today. Um, so we're very similar to uh, Michigan in a lot of uh, what we have in the state of California. So you know, our, our landscape around, you know, the, the setting of goals for minority and women-owned businesses. Um, we have a, a constitutional prohibition, 
other than the federal disadvantaged business enterprise program for transportation programs. It's been around since the, the 90s. And um, so we are prohibited from, you know, setting race and gender specific goals in our contracts. I think we um, may have lost Angela for this one. She's back. Oh, sorry. Are you still able to hear me? We got okay. you back. Yes. Okay. Sorry. I, it looks like I still have a good connection. So, um, okay. So at any rate, we're, we're similar to Michigan in that, um, in that respect. And so as a result, we've really had to pivot. Are you still able to hear me? Okay, yes. We're, we've really had to pivot in the state of California since roughly the early early '90s to be able to, you know, look at what what kind of um, diversity we have in our contracting programs. And so, you know, we have a a uh, 25 percent uh, executive order order goal for small business participation. It's been around since 2006. And then we have a statutory requirement for our disabled veteran business enterprise program that's at 3%, um, you know, of state spend. And so, you know, with those two programs, we've really uh, pivoted to focus on uh, our outreach efforts, uh, you know, first and foremost. And so, you know, we, we have a long established office of our small and disabled veteran business enterprise services. And so we as Department of General Services are the lead agency in certifying these firms across the state of California. And so, you know, our, our office has been around for a very long time, and that's really the one that focuses on how we can outreach to increase um, certification in those two programs, and then making sure that the diversity uh, within those two programs is there as well. And so, you know, we partner with uh, a lot of strategic partners, um, ethnic chambers of commerce, uh, minority and women uh, business organizations, veteran organizations. We also uh, use the small business development centers, uh, the PTACs, and then we have several reciprocity partners through our local government agencies that also recognize our state certification programs and are able to use them in their own supplier diversity programs. And so we have over 30 of these strategic partnerships, um, and we also provide funding uh, specifically for outreach events for, you know, things like the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, the African American Chambers, those sorts of things. Um, and that helps us get the word out to these uh, minority focused organizations on, you know, how the state's contracting programs work um, and then what our opportunities are. Um, so, you know, again, we, we attend a lot of these um, efforts during the year. Uh, last year, we had 132 events, 6,700 in attendance. So this is a, a, one of our biggest areas um, that we work on to try and increase use of these uh, types of businesses in our programs. We post uh, small business um, success stories um, on our website. We post our training in, uh, you know, different languages on how to do business with the state. Uh, similar to Michigan, uh, we also have um, a uh, newly developed uh, site that allows us to go in um, and look at where we have our certifications across the state. And so we compare that um, with a uh, GIS tool that allows us to see um, across the areas in the state you know, where our firms are certified and, and where we're missing certified firms and whether those areas are considered disadvantaged areas um, from an economic perspective. So we're able to kind of overlay, you know, we know in this zip code, we have this number of small businesses certified in these particular areas for what the state's buying. But we have this uh, zip code over here that's considered disadvantaged, um, and we don't have um, any certified firms in that area. And so as part of our economic recovery, we're also looking at, you know, outreaching then to those businesses to see if we can't get them certified. So it's our CalSAT map, and I see that Danetta posted a link um, in the chat for that. A couple of the other things that we do, um, and we'll we'll talk a little bit more about our partnerships, but we do have a small business advisory council that has a set of diverse, uh, you know, businesses and organizations that we meet with to hear about, you know, what are the challenges uh, for doing state contracting, you know, and what can we help with. Um, so that's really at a statewide level. Um, you know, from a policy perspective, um, there was a question asked uh, of Michigan about, you know. We have similar programs with respect to, uh, you know, use of small businesses directly, and so we we had a piece of legislation that was passed in California this last session that talks about the the mandatory requirement for state departments to vary um, their use of small businesses, and it's very specific to say, you know, and you have to include in your solicitations businesses that that 
either have not done work with the state of California in the past or businesses that you as a department have not regularly used. So it's it's kind of varying both at a, at a high level. If they've never done business with the state, but they're certified, you have to include them in your solicitation process. Or they may have done business with you regular or, or with another department regularly, but they've never done business with you. So you also need to include those in your solicitation. So um, we're working on policy right now uh, to address that. Um, as far as our programs go, we have this, some of the similar programs. We have what we call an SBDVBE option, similar to what Jared talked about. Ours goes up to 250,000 or 333,000 for public works projects. Um, and essentially buyers can contact two small businesses or two uh, DVBEs directly to get a quote. And then you award using a best value methodology rather than a low bid methodology. Um, we have a small business preference program that allows for a cost reduction of 5% for bid evaluation purposes. Um, and if you're not a certified firm, but you commit to using 25% small business participation, you can also get a 5% preference. Um, we have our fair and reasonable procurement method um, that doesn't require competition. It's up to 10,000. Uh, again, it's just an evaluation that the pricing is you know, fair and reasonable. And a lot of those contracts go directly to our SBDVBE firms. And then we also have a small business first policy program that our state departments can use. It's not mandatory, it's, it's voluntary. But it's really a public statement for them to say, look, we're committing to using small businesses and DVBEs first in our procurement programs in every instance that we can, because the, the couple of programs that I mentioned before are not mandatory. You, you don't have to use the SB option. Um, it's just it's something you can use. And so this is really an opportunity for state departments to come out and make that commitment that they're going to funnel those dollars directly to those entities first. Um, and then just I know we're running uh, low on time. So, you know, just just a couple things, you know, of course, like other states, we were hit really hard with the pandemic, with wildfires, with, you know, lots of things that happened in the state of California. And so we found that our small business participation has gone down in those instances where, you know, we are awarding under emergency procurement processes um, rather than competitive procurement processes. And so we put together a tool this last year that allows our SBs and DVBEs to register in an emergency procurement system so that they can go in and say, look, I'm a small business. I commit that I can perform, um, let's say, uh, you know, I supply generators for emergency purposes. And so it allows the buyers to go right into that particular database to find a, a, a ready, willing, and able certified firm, as opposed to our certification database that has over 20,000 certified small business firms in the state. So um, we're hopeful that this will help us can, you know, drive those dollars back up to our SBs and DVBEs for emergency procurements. Um, and then the, just the last thing is that we did um, just establish a new executive position uh, within our organization for um, a statewide supplier diversity program manager so that we can continue to focus and put an emphasis on the fact that we do want to continue to get diversity within our supplier pool. So I'll stop there. Thanks, Angela. I appreciate it. And I appreciate everybody dropping um, some links in the chat. It's great to see what's happening in the other states, as well as those that are on the call with us today with our panelists. Um, the GIS tracking is very intriguing, so I appreciate you all sharing about that. Let me toss out um, a question that's come from the audience from a couple of different perspectives, but around the same concept. Tell us a little bit in your states um, how you recognize out-of-state certified diversity businesses, as well as how you're dealing with out-of-state Native American vendors who are interested in procurement. Any thoughts from the panelists around out-of-state vendors or specifically working with Native, Native American vendors? Well, I can start in California. So, you know, for our purposes, for our small business, you have to be domiciled in the state of California. So you have to be a California-based business in order to be certified. And so we do not accept uh, reciprocity from other states uh, with our uh, California uh, small business. The same with our disabled veteran, because the intent of that program um, is to address uh, California veterans. And so although um, you don't necessarily, your business doesn't have to be domiciled in California, owners do. Um, and so that's a little bit of a nuance. Um, 
With respect to our DBE programs, yes, th that follows the federal rules and there are some reciprocity um, allowances there. Um, but we uh, tr predominantly do not allow uh, out-of-state certifications um, as part of our programs. Uh, the same is true in Minnesota. You have to have your principal place of business here in the state. Michigan as well. I dropped this in the chat, but Washington as well. I think um, there's the the intent, like Angela said, is to support uh, the businesses who are local to your state. Um, so that's where a lot of these uh, these programs are coming from. That's great. I appreciate you all responding to that. Tara, let me stay with you if we can. Um, you've talked a little bit about utilizing the Business Diversity Advisory Group and really how that group has been beneficial to the state. Can you share a little bit with the audience around how this group was selected, how it operates, and maybe some of the strategies you're finding most beneficial? Thanks, Pam. Yes, I. it's similar to actually what Angela also just mentioned about her, the advisory council that, that she's had. And I think it's become or, or should be certainly a best practice for those of us conducting uh, public procurement processes. I think we recognize how it can be a pretty complicated and clunky process for especially a small business uh, vendor to go through. And there's reasons for that. Um, when we're spending taxpayer dollars, you, you have requirements and, and, and such, but um, it's important for us to always be listening for opportunities to how we can make our, our contracts and requirements more accessible. So um, this group, the Business, Divi Business Diversity Advisory Group was created uh, back in 2018 for that purpose. So we've formalized it in a way that uh, requires an application process. So we have anywhere from uh, 20 to 22 members at any time. These are members of the small business and um, minority owned business community. Um, they'll serve anywhere from a one to three year term. We meet every month still. Um, and I have found that this is a really valuable resource for me as a leader to listen. Um, and it goes both ways because while I'm listening to them um, and getting their input and feedback about our processes, um, they're also listening to us, which allows us to keep them well informed about changes, to share our, some of our own successes and, and gain their buy-in about some of our, our procedures and policies. Um, but there's been some really tangible uh, examples of how they've really helped our processes um, from the little things like just telling us what it's like to navigate our own web-based um, purchasing system when they have to register their business and 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 register for bids there's there's sometimes difficulties in doing that obviously so we've been able to take that very specific advice um, and turn that into uh, a more transparent process even something like adding documents that uh, we have available, but we didn't put them in a certain place in the website for them to be able to easily use during a, a proposal process. So it makes their job easier um, when they have more accessibility to documents and, and a lot of examples of uh, more transparent processes like this that just make it easier for them to uh, bid on different contracts. And then one of our um, subcommittees of this group was the policy committee, and they played, um, these are professionals who ha are, are small business owners themselves, maybe they're working in the community around this work as well. So they've been able to bring us some really great insights and have helped create our own supplier diversity policy that we're implementing now across all state agencies. Um, and if I have a chance later, I'll talk a little bit more about that that policy, but it's a great group that I, I highly recommend if agencies uh, don't already have an advisory group like that already in place. Great, that's very helpful to hear and understand. Um, Alice, in Minnesota, did you all use a disparity study also as a foundation for the work that you're doing? And if so, was it legislatively mandated? Tell us a little bit about that. We did conduct a joint disparity study in 2017. Um, we call it a joint disparity study because there were nine entities that were led by the Department of Administration. Uh, the first time that we've ever done that before, and we don't know that others have done it this way, but we also brought along the uh, city of Minneapolis, the city of St. Paul, 
uh, Hennepin County came along with us. We had the Mosquito Control District, the Airport Commission. Everyone came together, uh, is my point, to do the Joint Disparity Study together instead of doing them individually. Uh, it is not required legislatively, although in order for us to have a, um, a program here in the state, we do have to demonstrate that there is racial disparity uh, happening in the state. It's not because we don't think that it's happening, but we do have to demonstrate that it's happening here. Um, and so that is the legal basis upon which we build our uh, supplier diversity program in the state. And I will note that uh, we have asked the legislature uh, and the governor to support funding for a joint disparity study again this year that we would start uh, most likely in 2023. Fantastic. I know we've heard from several of the NASCA members that those studies are or can be exceptionally beneficial if they're crafted in the correct fashion. And uh, I love your idea of doing that through a joint collaborative process. Jared, tell us a little bit more about um, Michigan's My Supplier Community Program and kind of help us understand how that's streamlining your process there. Sure. Um, so the My Supplier Community Program, um, it targets communities that we want to help have additional procurement opportunities. Um, it's it, the members or the, the type of suppliers that are included are small businesses, veteran-owned businesses, both SDVOB, service disabled, as well as um, non-service disabled, uh, community rehabilitation organizations, so think like sheltered workshops, and then the geographically disadvantaged business enterprises. And so they are the ones that are able to, you know, obtain contracts up to $500,000 through just a quoting process as opposed through an RFP. Um, the, on the state side, state agencies are not required to go to our state administrative board. Um, with these contracts. So normally our threshold for our, our administrative board is 250,000. Um, that can add a month on to the procurement process. Um, so that eliminates that step for them. So that it streamlines it again for them. And then we, we host a, um, a My Supplier Community Roundtable as well that, that takes these types of businesses um, and goes one step up to their professional organizations and and brings them together, similar to have others as mentioned, to listen to them, um, for us to promote our programs with them, to have one-on-ones with them and hear, you know, where additional heartburn do they have? Where can we streamline it easier? Where can we make things more accessible? I really think, you know, in all these discussions, really you're looking at increasing transparency and increasing opportunity. Um, and so the more you can kind of learn from them about where those, uh, uh, roadblocks are, uh, the better you can reduce them to make it, you know, a more competitive environment. And a more competitive environment doesn't just benefit the suppliers, it benefits the procurement offices and the state agencies as well. Yeah, absolutely. Very important. And Pam, I do want to know, someone asked in the chat, um, how, if we self-cert, or if we certify the, the companies that are part of those communities, and so we started with doing um, a self-certification process, um, which has been slow going. Um, companies are, aren't always that willing to go in and do the additional work to add their firmographic type or the demographic types. Um, and so we are in the process of working with a third party that will analyze our entire vendor file and update the firmographic and demographic information for all of them so that we would have kind of a more robust community to um, work with as opposed to only the, the ones that have gone in and, and done the certification themselves. Great, thank you. I appreciate you responding to that question. So Angela, I know you all also work with um, an, a smaller group or a group that's dedicated to the work that you're doing. I think you call it the Small Business Minority Owners Task Force. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so we implemented this a little over a year ago, um, and it is, it's a, it's a set of uh, small businesses um, that are minority and women owned, and it, we meet with them on a monthly basis, and they give us just a slightly different perspective from what we might get from our larger uh, small business advisory council, council, which has, you know, 30 plus members on it, but our, um, it, it's our minority owned small business uh, task force, um, and so they, we, we meet with them regularly and they're able to kind of give us more specific examples of areas in which they are seeing 
um, what what would be potential uh, discriminatory practices or you know uh, instances in which small businesses um, that are minority or women owned are are left out of the process and and what their thoughts are on how to correct that. So it's really just a, a supplement to our small business advisory council, but it's been a great opportunity to hear their perspective. Many of them are are businesses that are actively working with the state of California. So it isn't just somebody that's never done a contract with the state. Um, and so they're able to really give us a perspective on our processes and, you know, how in specific areas, you know, it, it might be something that we can improve upon. So, you know, we're, we're happy to have that opportunity to, to hear from this additional subset of, of businesses. Yeah, I'm certain that voice is very, very powerful in the work that you're doing. I appreciate that. Um, Tara, you had shared with me earlier that you all have created some toolkits or a toolkit for your agencies with some very specific examples and best practices. Will you share a little bit with the group about what that toolkit looks like? I would love to. Um, following the disparity report in 2019, we received a, a list of recommendations uh, that were really valuable uh, as state agencies doing procurement. Um, so we turned that into what we call the tools for equity and public spending. Um, and that lists a myriad of different things that um, state agency procurement professionals can use when they're competing for contracts. Um, most recently, our agency, Department of Enterprise Services, as the agency responsible for centralized procurement across the state, um, we manage all of the primary contracts that state agencies are required to use. Um, so we don't manage all procurements, but we do manage a majority of them. And so we have established, we've taken the tools that were offered to agency procurement professionals and turned that into uh, a requirement so that if they're not using one of our contracts that we've established um, with these best practice tools, um, that they're required when it makes sense to use some of these tools that were recommended originally in the disparity report. Um, so our policy uh, will hold uh, agency procurement professionals accountable for utilizing these um, methods of award that uh, help enhance accessibility for minority and small um, businesses. Um, just a few examples of that, which some of you may already be using or may have heard about before. If not, hopefully uh, we're giving you some, some great new ideas. Unbundling is one that we use a lot because it's it's pretty easy to apply, um, as it, but it requires a different way of thinking. Um, so if you're having, for example, if you're putting out a contract for fuel uh, statewide, which might be a pretty big contract, instead of uh, putting that out as a method to one highest responsible, responsive bidder, you might think at, about breaking that up, unbundling that into groups. Um, for fuel, it's a it's a delivery based service. So it's easy to break that up by region um, and then even break that up into multiple uh, award opportunities within each region so that your users have uh, more options in case one vendor isn't, isn't available. And also you're providing more award opportunities for small businesses. Um, another example is reserve awards. We use reserve awards for small um, and veterinary uh, veterinary, veteran-based, veteran-owned firms um, because they're race and neutral gender. Um, so we'll set aside a certain amount uh, of a contract where there's availability to do that. Uh, inclusion plans, most of you probably use inclusion plans for your public works contracting, and that's one of uh, the requirements that we're including in our uh, policy following this uh, toolkit. Um, and other things such as the barriers that we've all heard about from small businesses when we require um, really exorbitant bonding or insurance requirements. These are all ways and tools that procurement agents can use to um, look at them, carefully scrutinize whether a contract really needs them and help increase accessibility to state contracts for small businesses. Um, so we'll be, we'll be providing training um, that'll be mandatory to all procurement professionals in the next six months. And again, just creating that accountability um, for all of us going forward. And are those resources available online to the public? We have a, a great source uh, for the tools for equity. I will drop it here in the chat um, and then be happy, of course, to answer any specific questions. Great, thank you. I um, mean, Alice, you were sharing a little bit about Minnesota's target group business program. Um, what do you think is the biggest benefit from that program? What are you all doing with the group? 
Well, I think the, the biggest benefit um, is that we are seeing that we are impacting communities in which they live and work. Um, we've seen about a 4,000% increase in uh, spend with black owned businesses. We've seen tremendous increase with uh, native owned businesses as well. Uh, what we're seeing is just the, the the program itself is really doing what it's intended to do. Uh, our veteran owned businesses have really flourished in the past two to three years. And so uh, the, the targeted group business program overall has uh, developed and uh, done exactly what it's been intended to do. Fantastic. So we're getting pretty close on time. I want to ask a couple more questions and then uh, we will wrap up for the afternoon. But Jared, you mentioned when you were first talking about the um, social media campaign that you all use there in Michigan, which is um, a little unique from what we've seen here at NASCO. Will you share a little bit more about how you're really targeting different groups through social media? Sure. Yeah. So every um, two weeks, my sourcing team talks, uh, gets with my communications manager and talks about what upcoming bids we have. So these aren't bids that are already posted. These are bids that we anticipate being posted in the next two to three weeks. Um, and then, you know, he puts, we have a nice little template, gets it out and we get it out on Twitter um, and we get people to share it, right? And just try to build some engagement. And it just keeps giving um, more and more opportunities for people to, for it to catch their eye, to say, hey, this is something that, you know, I could bid on. Um, really trying to look for companies who have never done business with the state before and increasing that level of competition. We also share it with all of our um, My Supplier Community Roundtable members for them to share with their members. So, you know, we share it out with the organizations with the hope that they can push it down to their members. Again, trying to drive engagement and just getting more and more eyes on it. We've seen some good impacts. Um, so generally when we put something out to bid, you know, if we're not promoting it, we might get anywhere from like, you know, two to let's say six or two to eight bidders on it. Um, on something we generally promote, we're seeing about, you know, an increase of maybe one to two bidders, but we have seen some record numbers on a couple of bids that we've put out in which we received 18 and 23 bidders on it. Um, so again, the more eyes that we can get on something, the more we can get more people to the table. And again, I'm looking from a, from a selfish perspective, I'm looking to increase competition so I can get better contracts. I think that's the way that you can really sell it to an agency. Um, when you don't have a mandate of a percentage or you know, a number of opportunities of increase your competition so that you can get the best available contract for your program. And is that coming directly from your office, Jared? At the Yeah, um, so my communications manager, um, had prior experience in doing socials for a large um, local unit of government on the East Coast. Um, and he has uh, a very successful parody um, Twitter account that he runs on his own. Um, and so we knew that he had that social media background and we thought that we could kind of use that to our advantage in building out um, you know, a procurement social media presence. That's exciting. So Angela, let me just wrap up with you. Uh, right now, you all are doing a voluntary data collection. Uh, do you have any plans for changing that approach? Yeah, so for now, it's, it is voluntary uh, per our statute and we collect information on every contract award. Uh, it's voluntary data that we ask the, the awarded uh, vendor to submit back to the state on you know, women, minority, um, LGBTQ. We ask those questions and we get it back. Um, we use that information to just kind of get a perspective on where we think we might be, but we know that we don't get a lot of response. Our success rate isn't very good. And so we're looking to actually uh, allow our vendors in our certification database and then our, just our vendors in general across the state to be able to add that nomenclature to their certification or their status as a vendor with the state of California. Again, because of our statutory construction, we can't use that to then set contract goals, but it, it gives us an ability to know kind of a benchmark of where we are. We're also looking to do a disparity study in the state of California in the future so that we will also be able to use that and hopefully in the future be able to get to a state where we, you know, we do have uh, more requirements in contracts. So today we're looking to just continue collecting it, do it online, allow the ability for people to, you know, post that information voluntarily to, to get a better sense of where we're at. Great. Fantastic. Well, in our one minute that we have remaining, let me ask all four of our speakers today, 
what would be your one action step or your one key takeaway for today's audience? Where do you think states could or should start in this area? Tara, let's start with you. Well, I heard a lot of folks say that uh, race and gender based programs are prohibited in their state. And that's going to be true in, in most places in this country because you have to meet a very strict standard for that type of program. So I would start with data collection, even the type of voluntary data collection that Angela just mentioned. Um, it's a long term strategy, but when you have the data uh, that you need to eventually do a disparity report, it can create the right legal path that you need um, to address real inequities in, in contracting in your community. Perfect. Alice, how about you? Uh, I would say start with the data, but I would start with the spend data. I'd start with understanding where the money is being step, spent within your state, uh, and that will help you direct uh, how you want to shape your program. Yeah, finally important. Jared, what's your golden nugget? Listen, you know, engage with the people that are directly impacted, you know, engage with your supplier community and listen to where they see problems, um, right? And then when you come up with solutions, use them as your sounding board on will these, will these solutions actually impact the problem that you guys are um, seeing or experiencing? Yeah, vitally important as well. And Angela, what's your key takeaway today? Yeah, I would say the exact same thing. You've, you got to start with the data and then you've got to have what Jared just said, the listening. It, it's so important. Um, they, they have to feel like they're being you know, acknowledged and you're, you're taking to heart what they're saying. And so we, we spend a lot of time really trying to do that in the state, you know, given our, our constraints. And so I would say those are both equally as important. Fantastic. What a wonderful conversation we have had today. Thank you so much, Tara, Alice, Jared, Angela, for bringing your thought leadership and all the excellent programs that you all are showcasing there in your states. It's so nice to have all of your leadership here sharing with our NASCA members today. Um, thanks to everyone on the call. We appreciate you dialing in. We will have this recording available in the NASCA Knowledge Center in a few days if you would like to go back or please share this within your team and your networks as well. Um, our next NASCA TV event will be in mid-February around a 2022 forecast with a lot of our strategic partners. Um, we'll have the um, groups from NASIO, NASBO, NASPO, NASPI, NASPA. All of our sister associations will be with us sharing their trends and things to watch in 2022. So you won't want to miss that. Thank you again for joining us today. Thanks you so much to all of our speakers. And we really appreciate you all joining NASCA. We'll see you all soon. Thank you. Thanks, NASCA. Thanks, everybody.